just give me a second. You guys can, can you guys see me on Zoom? Okay, it looks okay. Can you guys see me and hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay, good. I was worried about it freezing. All right. Um, just want to make some announcements first. All right. Um, the lab worksheet is due tonight. Um, what I might do at the end here is answer some questions on the uh, lab worksheet. Uh, but first, I want to talk about the new lab and talk about next week. Okay. Next week is when we'll have our first exam and it'll be for you guys it'll be administered at this time in room S102 okay what I need for you to do is get here early like 915 and make sure that you use the Sierra College app to check yourselves in to do the uh, health pre-screening then you're going to show me that it was okay you do it on your smartphone you should have the Sierra College app on your heart on your smartphone if not we have paperwork you can fill out okay make sure you bring a mask you wear a mask okay you have to wear a mask when you're uh, taking the exam if you forget a calculator, I have extra calculators. You can only use a scientific calculator. If you don't have, if, if you're using, um, if you have with you a calculator that's not scientific, I'm going to ask you to put it away and I'm going to give you one of ours. Okay? So you have to use a scientific calculator for the exam next week. Um, just make sure you get here. Probably about 15 minutes before class starts so that you can get checked in and um, all set and then you can start taking the exam. The exam will be about an hour and 25 minutes. I need a little bit of time to, uh, for the transition to the next group. Any questions about the procedures for next week? No questions? No concerns? Okay, everybody's out there? All right. Um, what I want to talk about today is really it's, it's two labs. Okay, the first lab, the file that's on Canvas is file 01A and it says uh, equipment for properties of charge. Okay. This one will be due next week. It, actually, it's, it'll be due, you have a little bit more than one week because we have the exam on Friday. Uh, it'll be due on um, Monday, September 13th. Okay, so this will be due on the 13th. And this will be due, the second one will be due two weeks after. For our first lab, you're going to build some equipment so that you can do the second lab. The equipment that you're going to use to build uh, or the, the materials that you're going to use to build the equipment can be obtained from home. And so I'm going to assume you're going to use stuff from home because it's, really, it's readily available. Okay. The two devices you're going to build are an electroscope, which is a device to, device to measure charge. And I'm going to walk up to the camera so you can kind of look at it. It's like this. It's basically a jar. It doesn't have to be a jar. It could be a glass with a piece of aluminum foil 
suspended by some conductor and you have a big ball of aluminum at the top which is also connected to that conductor and a lid that's it like I said you don't need a jar you could you, you got to be able to see through it okay because you got to videotape you got to show me that this thing works The other device is called an electrophorus. I'm going to talk a little bit more about it uh, today. Basically, it's a paper plate with an aluminum foil wrapped around it and a handle. Okay? And you're going to need a bottom to it that's an insulator. I'm using a piece of styrofoam. You can use saran wrap. You can use a transparency. Okay, you don't have to use these materials. Basically, uh, you have to be, these have to be such that you can charge, charge things up. So if you don't have a piece of styrofoam, you can use saran wrap or you can use transparency. Okay, and I'll talk a little bit more about the materials you can use in a little bit. And so all you got to do is build these, create a video showing me that you built it, and you have to, I have to see your face in the video, okay? The video you create has, you have to show me your face and your equipment, and you have to show me that it, the equipment works. That's it. Okay? That'll be due on the 13th. Then you're going to use that equipment to do a lab called properties of charge. And I'm going to lecture today on properties of charge. Okay, that's going to be the really the first chapter, essentially the first chapter of our next unit. Okay. But the stuff I'm going to talk about today is very qualitative. No equ no equations. Okay? The lab these two labs have no equations you're going to be working with. You're going to observe and you're going to explain. And you're going to create video reports in both cases. This lab, this first lab, is individualized. This second lab, you have the option of working with partners. So you can have a group of two, or you can have a group of three to make this lab. Okay, to do this lab and videotape it. And I know we have, uh, some people are uncomfortable because of COVID, some people are okay with it. And so if you're gonna make a video with a lab group, what I expect is that the people in the group are working together on the project. I, I don't want to see a video where one person does this part of the lab separately from another person. Okay, if you're going to work with lab partners for the second lab, you kind of got to work together. Okay, but you can't have more than three people in the group. It's either one, two, or three in your group. Okay, so you have that option. But if you have partners, you kind of, you, you need to do the, you need to film to get the, the lab together. Questions? Concerns? Okay. So this first one is a 20-point lab. The second one is a 40-point lab. Because the second one really helped, you're supposed to explain how things work. Okay, based on what I talk about in this lecture and what I start talking about next week. Because on Wednesday, once I finish the material relativity, I'm going to start on properties of charge. I'm going to start, start talking about properties of charge and the laws governing them. So let me start by talking a little bit about the properties of charge, some basic ideas. And what I'm going to say here is somewhat idealized. I have a listed in the notes there 
And I'm, I'm going to make this a little bit bigger so you can see it better, because I'm not going to do a lot of writing on the board. Hopefully that's better. Um, there's a little bit of history there showing, uh, regarding what we know or how we learned about the properties of charge. It really, the idea, the, the properties have been understood since around 600 BC. In around 18th century, Franklin, that's, ben, that's actually Benjamin Franklin, talked about the fact there's really two types of electricity. Positive type and negative type. Okay. And Franklin introduced the idea or the concept of conservation of charge. So charge is conserved just like mass. So I should probably, something I should write that, I should really write that down. That's an important property, that charge is conserved, just like mass. Okay, whatever process system undergoes, charge is conserved. Okay, same thing with mass. Of course, now that we've talked about relativity, you really want to say energy is conserved. Okay. In 1997, Thomson, J.J. Thomson, measured the charge to mass ratio of the electron. And then Millikan, did an experiment that measured the charge on the electron. Okay. And we actually then knew its mass. Since we knew the charge of the mass ratio. Because the mass of the electron is very, is very light. 9.11 times 10 to minus 31 kilograms. The charge of the electron is 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19th. Okay, these are the values. That, and, and all charges are, are multiples of this number, or linear combinations of this number, because the proton has the uh, same magnitude but opposite charge. And this is the unit for charge. Charge is another fundamental measurement that you're going to learn. You've learned so far three fundamental measurements if you've only taken 205. Okay? They are... Do you know what they are, what, what the fundamental measurements are that you learn in 205? Can you tell me them? Is it force and energy? I'm sorry. I can't hear you very well. Uh, is it force and energy? I can't. Well, force and energy are very fundamental quantities, but they're not fundamental measurements because force and energy depend on other measurements. Mass, time, mass. and length? Yeah, mass. You said time. And the other one's length. Is length not dependent on time, though? No, because if you measure the, the, the size of a ruler, it's, it's not time dependent, right? Okay. And, you, and the, when you associate units with this, you could, it'll, make, it'll be clear to you because you measure length. Length is in meters. Length is in centimeters. Right? These are the fundamental measurements. But then you can associate units, various units with each one of them. All right? For meters, centimeters, whatever. This will be seconds, typically seconds, hours, days, whatever. But if you take a length over time, like meters per second, then that's velocity. That's a derived physical quantity because it's, it's, it's derived from these two. It's not fundamental because it, it comes from these two. Force comes from these three. And these are what you learn in 205, but now you have another one, charge.
and we use the letter Q for charge, either capital Q or small Q. The last one you'll learn in 215, unless you have a chemistry, is temperature. Okay, those are fundamental the, the most fundamental quantities, and you, you might find one or two more, but base, those are the real most basic ones. Okay. And we use these a lot of times, and then when I teach physics A, I use these to talk about uh, uh, dimensional analysis, which you discuss in chemistry a lot, but when you do it in chemistry, you actually associate them with units. And I, I'm being more abstract because you can put any kind of units with these dimensions, okay, or measurements. So let me say a little bit more about charges. Like mass, charges exert, they exert forces on each other. Charge, like mass, is a scalar quantity. Charge, like mass, is conserved. The basic unit, the basic unit of charge is that value. Because everything comes at multiples of this number. And by the way, you might, those of you who read up on physics, mo very modern physics, might say, no, that's not right. I'm ignoring quarks for now. Okay, let's pretend quark, we haven't discovered quarks yet. Because quarks are multiples of one-third or two-thirds this value. Okay, so let's use, let's pretend we haven't, taught, we, we haven't discovered anything about quarks yet. Okay. The elementary charges that exist in nature, again, forgetting quarks, are the proton, the electron, and the neutron. This is a positive charge, this is a negative charge, zero charge. Okay, and all atoms are made up of three, three, these three particles. All molecules are made up of these three particles. All materials are made up of these three particles. Make sense? And so the electrical properties of materials are dependent on these three, these, what these three particles do. Okay. By the way, regarding the Coulomb charge, we can use just we can use just the letter C to denote Coulomb. And Coulomb is a small unit of charge, so uh, a lot of times you might see microcoulombs, nanocoulombs, picocoulombs. What's a nano? What does nano mean? Like nanocoulomb. Not sure if you use that in physics. 205. Anybody know uh, what nano means? Ten to the negative ninth. Ten to the negative ninth. Okay. And pico is ten to the minus twelve. Femto f. So, so this is pico coulombs. And there's femto. Ten to the minus fifteen. There's an addo. Addo is ten to the minus eighteen. We never, we already ever used that. Okay, so be familiar with these terms. So, like charges have the same algebraic sign, negative, uh, either both negative or both positive, and they always repel each other. Opposite charges always attract each other. 
If you have two electrons and two protons, and you combine them and you want to find a total charge, it's zero. Because a positive number times it's a negative number of equal magnitude gives you zero. Just like minus two plus two gives you zero. That's different from mass, because mass is always positive, and the, the attraction between two masses, I'm sorry, the force between two masses is always attractive. The nature of the gravitational force is due to the fact that the objects have mass. It has nothing to do with plus or minus charges. They're completely separate. They're completely distinct. Okay. The electric force between two charges is, is just due to the nature of the two charges themselves. You folks learned in Physics 205 that the force between two masses is given by this equation. All right, the magnitude of the force between two masses was given by this equation. That's what you learned in Physics 205, true? Next week, towards the end of class on Wednesday, I'm going to show, I'm, I'm going to write down, because I can't, I can't derive it. You can't derive this, right? This is just a law of physics. You, you don't derive it. The force between two charges, at least the magnitude of the force between two charges, looks like this. Very similar form. Just the, this constant is different. Okay, and I have to put it, absolute values here for the magnitude of the force because these can be positive or negative. Professor? Yes. This slide is blocking the denominator. Okay, sorry. I'll write it further up. Thank you. I'm too far away to, from the camera to see. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Sorry about that. I should, put a bo I should put a box here like I did the other day. It's just that the only difference, this force is much stronger than this force. We'll talk about that next week. Okay. This force can be attractive or repulsive. This force is always attractive. Okay. By the way, I apologize. I forgot my keyboard, so I have to actually walk up to the computer to change slides every time. An example of conservation of charge has to do with something called ele uh, positron, electron positron creation. You can take two beams of light, well, two photons, like gamma rays. They're very high energy. And you, you're probably reading about them in chapter 39 because we're, we're looking at we're looking at the energy mass relationship, and uh, uh, these are evident in systems where gamma rays are emitted, high energy photons of light. You can have two gamma rays, two photons. Or you can think of them as beams of light, but they're very high energy. They usually come from radioactive sources. They collide into each other. The two, the two photons disappear. And two particles are created. One's a positron, one is electron. A positron is basically the same as the electron, except it has the opposite charge. So light beams have no charge. Photons have no charge. So if you start with no charge, whatever you end up with has to have no charge. And that's what you get. And you see that, you can do this in the lab. You can slam them into each other, and one of the events that can occur 
is that these are produced. Such that the total momentum of these two combined is zero, because if, if you have these two photons of equal energy going towards each other, momentum is zero, then the final momentum of the system has to be zero. And these, these particles, if they have the same energy as each of the photons, that they'll actually be at rest. You can also take an electron and a positron slam them into each other hard enough so that the mass is converted into energy. from our e equals mc squared equation. And you get two photons going in opposite directions. Okay? Charge is conserved. You have no charge at the beginning, you have no charge afterwards. It's an example of conservation of charge. Okay, just one second. So now that we've talked about the basic constituents of, of matter, let's talk about how these things can combine. And again, I'm being very, con very conceptual and hand wavy in my description. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna really throw equations, okay? For this lab, you really don't need to know all the equations. You, you need to know about the behavior of things. So, the electrons, the protons, and the neutrons will form atoms, they'll form ions, and they'll form molecules. If I use the letter Z to denote the number of protons or the number of electrons okay well let's say well, let's say the number of protons if I use Z as a num uh, number of protons if I have an atom that's uncharged all atoms have the same number of protons and neutrons if Z protons, I'm sorry, let me rephrase that. All atoms have the same number of protons and electrons. Z protons, Z electrons. They're neutral. Because when you add up all the charges, you get zero. Does it make sense? As an example, helium. Helium has two protons and two electrons. Okay. However, helium also has two neutrons in the nucleus. So you have a nucleus and in the nucleus you have the protons and the neutrons and then running, circling around the, the traditional, I mean the old-fashioned way of describing the electron in an atom is that it orbits the nucleus, but that actually is not correct. You have to think of the electron as some sort of cloud of charge that's moving ar ar around the nucleus. Okay. Which you learn in 215. But, you know, the, the basic model, which is called the Bohr model, was the electron is circling around the, the nucleus. Okay. By the way, that model pretty much only worked for the uh, hydrogen atom. Okay. So the nucleus con contains the protons and the neutrons. So you can have a helium atom with two protons and two neutrons. You can have a helium atom with two protons and one neutron. 
Let's call a different isotope. Basically, isotopes of an atom are basically, you have this just different number of neutrons in the nucleus. Okay. And then there's ions. Ions are charged atoms. Of course, they can be charged molecules too, but let's focus on the atoms. Ions are, are charged atoms. What does that mean? Well, since the protons are in the nucleus, and the, the electrons are running around outside it, the electrons can be removed from an atom. You can't remove the proton from a nucleus, because if you remove the proton from a nucleus, then it becomes a different atom. And, and I, sh I shouldn't say you can't remove the proton, but it's really hard to do. Okay? It's really hard to take that proton out of there. So, if you're going to change the charge of an atom, you add or remove an electron from the atom. It's the easiest thing to do is to remove an electron. So if I have a helium atom with two protons and one electron, I've removed an electron and this has a positive charge. In fact, I can remove two electrons So basically, I, this is two protons, no electrons. That's called an alpha particle. How many electrons can I remove from an atom? Well, in the lab, if you take uranium, which has 92 protons, you can strip off 91 of them. So each time you take out, each time you remove an electron from an atom, it becomes more positively charged. It increases the charge by one, okay? One times the charge of the electron. So you can actually make this in the lab. Of course, this is gonna be extremely reactive. It's gonna suck up electrons. So if there's any electrons near it, it wants them, okay? But you can make this in the lab. Now, can you add electrons? Yeah, you can, you can add electrons. You can say, oh, let me try to make this, and I'll put a minus sign because now I have more negative charge than positive charge. One more negative charge than positive charge, so I put helium minus. In reality, you can't make this. Technically, I mean, you can, under very special circumstances, over a very short time period, you can form these, but uh, in general, uh, you're not going to, helium minus only will exist in a very special circumstance, okay, and for a very short period of time. In fact, the most electrons you can add to any atom is one, okay? The most electrons you can add to any atom is one. If you, have a, if you have an isolated atom, the most you can add is, electrons you can add is one. Okay, so there's no such thing as nitrogen minus three. They don't exist, okay? If you can make that in the lab, you probably win a Nobel Prize, okay? You can't even make nitrogen with one extra electron. There's certain atoms in which you cannot add a negative electron to it. And, and the reason why is because the electrons are if you want to put that extra electron in, they want to repel each other. So it's very difficult to add an extra electron to an atom. In fact, if you look in the periodic table, helium, argon, the Nobel gases, you really can't add an electron. Like I said, you can do this for a very special case, but it, it works over a small time period. Okay. And um, 
And you can also measure how much energy, you know, if, if, you, if you form a negative ion of fluorine, which is one of the best ones to make, uh, it, takes a, it, it actually takes a lot of energy, to, comparatively, to remove that extra electron out. Fluorine, chlorine, bromine, you can actually add the extra electron, and it wants to stay, stick to it, so stick to the atom. Okay. But um, these ions are what give materials like electrical properties. Of course, there's also molecules. Molecules are combinations of atoms. like H2O, and these can be charged and they have electrical properties. For that chemistry, you know that this thing has electrical properties. Okay? And these can be charged. I mean, you can take off an electro electron and it's, it's a charge. Some, you know, sometimes they're called radicals. Okay. And the last one I want to talk about is when you group a lot of atoms or molecules together, like that. You can actually form that in the lab. You can take 60 carbon atoms and form a big molecule. These actually have a special name. Oops, let me move that up. Those are called clusters. And people study the properties of clusters. You know, one of the things is how many, how many do I have to, these do I have to put together so that you go, you make a transition from a one phase of matter to another. Okay. Questions so far? Just one second. I'm having a little trouble. Sorry, I had something come up I had to take care of. Okay. All right, so let me advance the slide. Now, these atoms, molecules, clusters, they actually were what form solids like uh, it's two by four, okay? It's the atoms, molecules, or whatever that combine together that forms this two by four, or this can. And, be, and because of that, they all have electrical properties. And I'm gonna simplify things in terms of electrical properties. I'm going, to, I'm going to categorize materials into two types. One is called a conductor, and, and the other one's called an insulator. And I'm going to idealize them, even though th this is not the case. So we have conductors. And insulators.
What are conductors? Conductors and conductors, the ideal case, the electrons flow easily through the material. Generally, conductors are metals. When we're talking about solid materials, conductors are metals. In an insulator, in an insulator, the conductor, the electrons are not free to move. And so they cannot conduct electricity. If I hook up a battery to this rod, if I put the positive end of the battery here and the negative end of the battery here, nothing's going to happen in between because the electrons don't want to move. And by the way, it's only the negative charges that can move, not the positive charges because the protons are in the nucleus. They're not going to move. It's only the electrons you can push around in, in a material. Okay, only the negative charge. Are we okay with that? However, materials have a special property called polarizability, in which you can rearrange the, pes the, the positive and negative charge, the overall positive and negative charge. And really, you're rearranging the negative charge. Okay? And these materials are called dielectrics, they're insulators. So insulators have a way you can polarize the charge. You can separate the positive and negative. And if you forget chemistry, what's the most famous molecule that's inherently polarized? It's just water. Right? Water. Water is inherently polarized. There's actually a separation because of its structure. There's actually a separation of positive and negative charge. It's it's already polarized. So there are materials where the the and they're molecules, not atoms, where their structure has the positive and negative charge somehow separated. There's other molecules in which that's not the case. They're not, they're not polar, but you can still polarize them. Okay. So what happens when you take a charged object and put it next to an insulator. Nothing? Well, let's try an experiment. It's going to take me a second to set this up. And I'm going to focus on my table. And I'm going to change the view so I can get rid of the PowerPoint. Okay, so let me move equipment. Um, let's get these cans out of the way. And I'm going to do the following. I'm going to take two by four, and I'm going to balance it. It's a piece of wood. Oh, that, was, that worked pretty quick. Surprising. And so I'm going to do the following. I'm going to take a rubber rod, and I'm going to take fur. The rubber rod likes to pick up electrons. We know that from experiment. The fur likes to give off its electrons. And so I'm transferring charge by contact. By rubbing these two together, I'm transferring charge by contact. So I'm actually charging this object. This is neutral. So what happens That's not good.
What do you see? It's chasing your stick. It's chasing, it's, it's attracting to it. So even though this thing, even though, even though this two by four is uncharged and it's an insulator, it's still attracted to it. Why is that? Well, remember that in the atoms here that make up the molecule, the electrons are free to move. So if this is negatively charged, and I bring this near it, the electrons are going to run away from this rod. They want to get as far away from this rod as possible within the material. Well, if the electrons get as far away as possible, then you're going to leave a net positive charge distribution in the front. And so this negatively charged rod is going to be exposed to positive charge, and they're going to attract. And so, the, so what we've done is polarize the charge in the material. Oops, sorry. Okay. So the separation of the positive and negative charge creates something called a dipole. So you take the charge originally, the charge distribution probably looked like this. They, their centers kind of coincided with each other, with the negative charge on the outside, the positive charge on the inside. When I brought the rod near it, to the insulator, their charge is separated. And I form something called a dipole. Okay, when I separate two charges, I form a dipole. The value of each of these Q's is the same. And I define something called P, which is the same as momentum, unfortunately, is equal to the magnitude of each one of the charges times a vector that goes from the negative charge to the positive charge. And this is called the electric dipole moment. Okay? And by defining the electric dipole moment, we can actually do a bunch of calculations on the behavior of the dipoles in a material. I won't do that here because we haven't talked about uh, forces or anything yet. If you have an unpolarized material, I'm sorry, let me rephrase that. If you have a polar material in general, like water, if you have water, you know, water in a container, water's polarized. Water consists of these things called dipole moments. When you put a charged rod near the water molecule or near water, the region near the charged rod is going to have the dipoles realign themselves such that they align with the charge. Now that picture you see is exaggerated. Why is, exa is it exaggerated? Not every single dipole will align itself. But what happens is an overall tendency of the dipoles to align themselves towards that negatively charged rod that you see in the figure. If you have something that's unpolar like this rod, what will happen, I'm not this rod, this 2 by 4 what will happen is the dipoles will form themselves already aligned towards that charged rod. So when I, when I charged 
this PVC rod, I charge it by contact. This material likes to pick up electrons. The fur likes to give them off. So you have this in your kit, okay? You have a PVC rod, a white PVC rod in your lab kit. You don't have this. In fact, I should have taken mine out of the bag. But you have a white PVC rod that you get from Home Depot in your, in your lab kit, okay? Mine's, mine's black. I just like using this one, okay? So this likes picking up electrons. This likes giving them off. So when I charge by contact, what am I doing? Is it through the friction when I do this? And you will see a lot of websites say, yes, you know, this is because of friction. And my, what I would say is, be careful with that description because it's really not totally, it's not all really due to friction. The fact that you're charging by contact is that you're allowing the molecules of this material to interact with the molecules of this material. Okay. If I had two pieces of fur and rubbed them together, there's friction there, what's going to happen? All right, if I had two pieces of fur and rub them together like that, what's going to happen? Is one, of them, is one of them going to end up being charged? Do they trade in equal amounts? You what? Do they trade in equal amounts? Yeah, so what, what would happen is nothing, right? They have the same electrical properties, don't they? You're going to have a net transfer of zero charge pretty much okay you'll probably have some transfer of charge but it'll be a, the net will be zero there's friction there but the friction is not causing anything to happen in the end the friction allows the interaction to take place but it's the electrical properties of the material that causes charge transfer to occur and so you can do experiments to see which materials like to give off the electrons and which materials like to take electrons. And people have done that all over the years, and they've made a table. If you go on Wikipedia, you'll find the table. And this table is called a tribal electric. And spell. This series tells you how a material would like, how materials like to accept electrons or give them away. Okay. And there's tables all over the inter internet. You'll see, for example, styrofoam has a certain, pro a certain set of properties. Sty styrofoam likes to become negatively charged. Okay. So does PVC. And you'll see that in that table. And when you're at the extreme ends of the table, those are the ones that either like to pick up electrons the most or give off the electrons the most when you're at the extreme end. So, if you are building these devices, this is, by the way, this is called a trophorus for your lab, and something's not working, you can actually look up the tribal electric series online and see what material you may have at home that would make your system work best, like saran wrap or etc. Okay. Ideally, what you want to do, because it's easier to get, it's easier to get materials that like to accept negative charges. So you want something that accepts negative charges. 
Okay, find the best one you, can, you have at home. Styrofoam is good. Saran wrap's good. Transparencies are good. Okay. So when you're try, charging by contact, what you're doing is you're rubbing two things together and you're allowing an interaction to take place. The friction allows the interaction to take place, but it is the, the difference in their property, electrical properties, that allows the charge transfer to take place. So just be careful with that, okay? Especially when you read that on the internet. Now, the so, other Professor, yes. I have a question. So it's the friction that just allows it to have good contact, basically. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, it provides the, con the conduit for the interaction to take place, right? Because if you have two materials with the same electrical properties and you rub them together, you can rub them together until you're blue in the face. Nothing's going to happen, right? If you take two pieces of two materials that are the same, and we do this when, when, the, when, when the lab is on ground. We actually have the students do this, and they see that if, the, if you're rubbing two things together that are the same, nothing's going to happen. Because it's more than just saying it's friction. You have to worry, think about the electrical properties. Suppose I take a conductor that's neutral. What does that mean? A conductor that's neutral. Well, I have an equal number of positive and negative charges in it. And I take this rod and I bring the rod near the conductor. What's going to happen? Well, these electrons in the metal. The outer electrons in our metal are very free to move. They're almost not even attached to the atoms. The outer atoms, they're called the valence electrons. They're essentially not attached. They can go anywhere. They're not, they're not really at attached to any atom. Okay, essentially. So these electrons don't like those electrons. And so they're going to run away as much as possible. leaving a net positive charge. I'm not saying every single one moves away, but what's going to happen is you're going to have a net positive charge on the, on the front here and a net negative charge on the back. And so what you've done, you've temporarily induced charge, at least on, on this surface and on this surface. Overall, you have something like this. This is exaggerated because not, you're not going to get complete separation. Okay, but you'll have a bunch of ch positive charge here, a bunch of negative charge here. What if I do this, and then I take a, a wire, or actually, it doesn't have to be a wire, I can do it with my fingers. I take a wire and connect it into the earth. And I'm going to write it, I'm going to draw it like this. What's going to happen? Well, what's the Earth? The Earth is a big source of electrons. It's this big, overall, it's neutral. It has a bunch of electrons. What have you done now? You've given the electrons a path to get as far away from this rod is possible. And what are they going to do? They're going to go down here. And if while that rod is still there, I disconnect it, guess what I'm left with? I'm left with a positively charged rod. By doing this, this process where I connect this wire into the ground is called grounding. By the way, because I'm a conductor, I can, I can put my hand on it 
here and then touch maybe um, like the faucet in my, you know, the, my sink faucet because the sink faucet goes, the pipes go into the ground. I get the same effect. That's called grounding. What I've done then is I've charged this by induction. That's called charging by induction. Okay? That's a permanent induction of charge. And what I've done, so when you see this symbol, this, this means you grounded it. That's how grounding works. That's why you have grounding in your, in your house because, you know, let's say on, like on a refrigerator or a washer and dryer, if you have a short, the outside of the, of the uh, refrigerator is grounded, then any charges on the surface of the refrigerator just goes to ground. You don't get electrocuted. Okay. Anyway, this is called charging by induction. So there's two ways we, of charging, charging by contact, charging by induction. And in the lab, you're going to study this. OK, before I ask that question, let me talk about the lab again. You're going to build this device. This device is called an electroscope. It is used to detect charge. Okay. And I don't have, it's very difficult for me to do the demo, but hold on a second. So basically, if I take This rod, you have two, there's two leaves. Can you, can you see the aluminum foil, the leaves hanging there? Can you all see the leaves hanging? Yeah. Okay. So there's a metal rod that's connected to those leaves. And that, and that metal rod is connected to this, to this ball on top. If I charge this rod... And it's not going to work well because I, I, I'm, I'm, I wish I had a second camera to do this. If I take this rod and I've charged it, I'm going to give it a try anyway. Let's see if this, this will work. Sorry if it's... I'm going to try it. So here's the two leaves. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring the charge rod near it. And can you see the leaves slightly move? Very slightly. Yeah, very slightly. And, and the reason why is because I charged it and I took some time. <laughs> Sorry. I charged it and I took some time. You know, I took some time to set this up and so some of the charge drains off. Okay, but in the lab, what you're going to be doing is you're going to build this and you're going to show that it works by charging your PVC rod and bringing it near the electroscope. It'll, it, it'll work. The thing you have to work, think, think about is that those pieces, those pieces of aluminum foil, you want to make sure they're long and thin, which I tried to do. I had a student last year do, it in, do this in a, kind of like a wine bottle. And so she made the aluminum foil really long, like maybe twice that length, and it worked really great. Okay. If you make them short, it's not going to work very well. Additionally, don't use heavy-duty aluminum foil. It's too heavy. The original electroscope was made with gold leaf, very, th very thin gold leaf. That works fantastic, but we, don't have, we can't use gold leaf. I mean, we, it's a little expensive, okay? People would use very thin gold leaf to do, the, um, to do measurements. When people did the measurements in the 1700s, they used a gold leaf electroscope. This is another version of it that you would see in our lab. This is electrical connected to this rod, which rotates when, when something's charged. Okay, let me use this. To demonstrate, because this is be clear, I don't have to hold anything. 
But you can see this is going to move when I bring something charged near it. That's not good. Okay, I don't know why it didn't work. Hold on. Do you see it moving? Should work without me touching it. There, that's much better. So, electrical, electrostatic labs can be frustrating because sometimes they don't work very well because the conditions aren't right. If it's humid outside, which is not the case here, they don't work very well. Okay? So anyway, this is the electroscope you're going to build. It's very simple. Okay? If you have trouble with this, if you have trouble making this work, remember that next week I have open lab from 8 to 9.30, from 8 to 9.20. And I have open lab from 12.30 to 2. And I have open lab from 3.30 to about 5. I'm, here from, I'm going to be here from 8 to 5 next week. Okay, so when I'm not giving the exam, I will be free to answer your questions. And I can help you with, you just got to bring this, you got to bring your electroscope here, and I will help you with it. Okay? You can use any kind of jar or glass. You can use a drinking glass, too. It's got to be transparent so that when you videotape it, we can see. Right? And the video you're going to do, you're going to make, you're either going to put on Canvas, Canvas Studio, and share it with me, or, oops, let me change the camera view. I, I need my own camera person. Or you're going to put it on YouTube, okay, and share the link to it. Put on YouTube. Set it as unlisted, share me the link, and then I, then I can uh, view your, your lab report. Okay? This should be a fairly straightforward. The only hard part you're going to have is just making it work. Now, the second device is called an electrophorus. And to be honest, your electrophorus is not going to be as good as the ones we have here. There's a lot of videos online on how to make one. And you can make one so that it gets negatively charged or positively charged. Typically, an electrophorus looks like this. You have a big piece of wax like this, okay, which you can charge up and a metal plate that you put on top. And this thing charges by induction. What you do is you take some fur and rub it vigorously on the wax, like for about 30 seconds. Then you take the metal plate, put it on top, and then you touch your finger to ground. Well, let me rephrase that. You put one finger on ground, and the other finger you touch the top of the metal plate. Okay, so let me again change the camera view. So what I would do is, with one hand touch the faucet, the other hand touch this, and then this thing gets, I pull it up and this thing should be charged. Because, the, the reason why is because the wax is negatively charged, the electrons on the top of the plate want to get as far away from the wax as possible. And when I touch ground, now this is negatively charged. I'm oh, sorry, positively charged. And if you put it by the electroscope, I didn't, I didn't do a good job, but if you put it by the electroscope, it should deflect. Let me try one more time. My electroscope, this electroscope is pretty bad. I can't ground myself. Now 
That's not good. It worked better with my cheap one. Unfortunately, I'm having bad luck today. Like I said, these labs don't work very, don't always work, but the, you can get them to work. The problem I have right now is I have no way to ground myself other than just touching it. Yeah, it didn't work very, very well at all. Sorry. Your electroscope will be, your electrophores will be different. A plate, paper, or styrofoam, wrap aluminum foil around it, and glue a handle. I just use a cup. That's it. The bottom surface, instead of using wax, you can use styrofoam. The only bad thing about using the styrofoam, especially for me when I'm watching the videos, I get to hear this sound. Okay. I get to hear the people, the students rubbing the styrofoam, which is not a great sound. And then you charge the styrofoam, you charge this plate, and then you bring it next to your electroscope. The leaves will deflect. I did this last night, the leaves deflected. A little bit, but they deflected. If it works real well, they'll deflect a lot. In fact, for some reason, when I did it last semester, it worked much better. In fact, when this thing works quite well, when these work quite well, you can take this, put it next to a fluorescent bulb, and the, and the fluorescent bulb, if you turn the lights off, you'll see it flash. Questions? No questions? Okay. I'm going to leave this question to next week. Okay? Or not next week. Uh, actually, I'll probably leave it in. I'll probably leave it for the, the lecture next week or the next time we meet in a lab. Okay? So I'm going to hold off on this question. Any concerns about the lab? All right, so you folks have a nice weekend. We'll see you.